Now I'd like you to turn with me please to Romans chapter 2. Last week we began a passage uh, in chapter 1 which continues on through today's reading up to verse 16 in which the Apostle Paul is not explaining the gospel. Does that surprise you? He's not explaining the gospel in this passage at all. In fact, he's answering a question that could be put, which isn't asked, but the question would be, how does this world work? And how does God hold men responsible to him? In fact, you could say that the question is, how does God deal with the world of people that aren't Christians? Because obviously, quite clearly, he deals with Christians in a different way to the way in which he deals with people that are not Christians. I mean, for example, if you're a Christian, then you're saved, aren't you? That's not the same for people who aren't saved. And if you're a Christian, you have sins forgiven. And that's good, but that's not the same as people who aren't saved. They don't have their sins forgiven. So what we need to understand from Paul, he's going to be laying a foundation here. The foundation is going to be, how does God deal with the world in general? Because later on in the book, when we get to chapter 3 and 4 and 5, he'll then talk about how God saves people. But we haven't got to that bit yet. He's still going to be talking in this passage and in last week's passage about how God deals with the world in general. And that's a very important point. You know, most people look at the Bible in a very simplistic way. They look at the Bible, for example, and they think that every single verse in all the Bible is talking to the Christian. But of course... Before the day of Pentecost, there weren't any Christians in the world because by definition, a Christian is someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit and part of this unique body called the church, the company of Christians. Okay, And uh, prior to the day of Pentecost, there weren't any people that had the Holy Spirit like that. So therefore, it's like another world altogether. And that's what Paul is doing in this passage. He's going to explain. He's going to explain how God is dealing with mankind as a whole. Now in chapter 1 verse 18 to 32, which we looked at last week, he describes that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness in men. You don't need to have to go into the world and tell people that God hates sin. Because everybody knows that God hates sin. And if anybody ever has been a victim of crime, they hate sin as well. Nobody likes to have a crime perpetrated against them. Somebody breaks into your house tonight and steals your goods. You are allowed to be angry tomorrow. Because that's what it makes you feel like. It makes you feel cross. Makes you feel angry. Makes you feel violated and dirty. Somebody's invaded your life and takes something. And this wrath of God, this is an emotion. It is a sense of revulsion. God is revolted at how men act and how they live. And last week we had a really good description from the Apostle Paul as to all the various sins that men get steeped into. However, today, chapter, one, chapter 2, verse 1 to 16, we have a different type of passage. I'm going to call it, all are inexcusable. Because that's how he starts. He says in verse 1, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Just, just the other day, somebody said to me, Oh, you've got a really bad attitude. We were talking about false teaching. And they said, Oh, you've got a really bad attitude about false teachers. And I said, Listen, we're in a fight for the truth. This isn't a bad attitude. And apart from which, you have no right to judge me. You don't know me. You don't know my motives. You don't know anything about me. And what Paul is saying here is that the person that judges another person has no right to do that because he does the same things himself. You see? That's the point. He says, you who look down upon somebody for their great sin... 
How are you going to escape the judgment of God when you do exactly the same thing? But I'm running ahead of myself. Take a look at this little word, inexcusable. It's a very interesting word. It means indefensible. It means that you go to court and there's a prosecution, but there's no defense. There's nobody that's going to stand up and plead your side because there isn't a defense. You've declared yourself to be guilty and because you're therefore guilty, what are you going to say now in, in defense of yourself? There's nothing to say. There's no excuse whatsoever. The defense, if there is one, must remain silent. Have you ever been in that position with God in which you're just completely speechless and you have to hold your hands up and say, I did it. I've got no mitigating circumstances. I've got no excuses. I'm guilty. It takes courage. It takes courage to do that. Now the word judge there, interesting word, it means to distinguish. It means to decide. And by implication it means to try and to condemn and to punish. Do you know what? You can go to a million churches today and you won't find this preached that God is a righteous God and that he's not only righteous but he tries men he tests us and he condemns the wicked and he punishes the wicked this is just how it is in the world today and uh, of course a lot of people will say to me oh well I just want to hear about the love of God well we'll hear an awful lot about the love of God later but we need to establish the basic playing field the basic playing field of this world is that God holds all men accountable to him and that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the wickedness of man and that those who refuse his offer of grace and mercy will come under the judgment of God. And take a look at that little word, condemnest thyself. He says... <clears throat> That you who pronounce judgment on other people are actually condemning yourself. Well, how could that be? And it's because of this. It's because how you view other people and how you condemn other people will be the standard that God will use to condemn you. I didn't know that. By the way, this is nothing to do with being a Christian. This is how the world works. This is how the non-Christian world works. This is how the world works that you're a member of. You see, what the Lord Jesus explains is this. Right through the Gospels, he explains that if you're hard on people, God will be hard on you. If you're merciful, then you will find mercy from God. Got it? If you forgive men of their sins, then God will forgive you. Now this has got nothing to do with being a Christian, by the way. I keep needing to emphasize that. Because you don't receive as a Christian God's forgiveness because you forgive. It's the other way around. You receive God's forgiveness and then you learn to forgive. Now you see, that's a different thing altogether. But in the world, God holds men accountable, and if they are, have an unforgiving heart to the neighbor, then on judgment day, God will hold that non-believer accountable for that, and he will not forgive them, because they didn't forgive their brother. Now, do you see? So, so in the last chapter then, we look down, I'm sure you did, I'm sure everybody that reads it, we look down upon the degraded. We saw the exceeding sinfulness of men's sin. Now let me ask you, what excuse do you have? Okay? You who condemn the sinner, but do the same. There's no excuse, is there? No excuse at all. Now verse 2 says this, We are sure, and this is Paul speaking, that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who commit such things. What he's saying is this. The judgment of God, when it comes upon the ungodly, will not make a mistake. See, let me, get, let me put it to you like this. Have you ever been to a court? Put your hand up. Have you ever been to a court? Okay. And when you enter the court, what, what, what's the court for? The court is there to try to discover what really happened. 
Okay? Evidence is brought forth. It might be witnesses. It might be written statements. It might be a transcript of what the person confessed to. Okay? And what they're trying to get to the bottom of is the truth. They're trying to find out what really happened. That's why when you're a witness, they make you stand there with a Bible in your hand and say, I promise, I swear, that I will tell the truth. And all the truth and nothing but the truth. Let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, there will only be the truth. There will be all the truth and there will be nothing but the truth. Now that is shocking. Because you see, there's lots of people in the world who hide their sin. Their sin is done in the dark. Their sin is done behind closed doors. It will all be brought out into the open on that day. The prophet says that every man will stand naked before God. There will be nothing to hide that day. Every man will be accountable. We are sure, he says, that the judgment of God is according to the truth against wicked men. Now notice, I'm, I'm emphasizing that. It's not about being a Christian, this passage. It's about those who are non-Christians. Okay. Now take a look at the next uh, <coughs> sentence. Verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? What would you think? I remember a dear friend of mine many years ago. He was a magistrate's clerk. And he was very sensitive to make sure that he didn't break the speed limit or anything of that nature. Why? Because he'd have had to go and stand in the dock in his own court and be accountable for breaking the law. Now then, what the Apostle Paul says is this. He says, you who look down on sinners, you do the same. Now, because you do the same, do you think that through some quirk of fate you're going to be able to escape God's judgment? This is a question I like to ask people. Not because I want to upset them, because I want them to think. Think. Do you think, if you're not a Christian, that you will be able to escape God's judgment? God's judgment will be according to truth. But notice this. Every single person that ever needs to be judged will be there. Nobody will escape. Take a look at verse 4. Now verse 4 is a, a verse which initially one might find a little bit tricky to get into our heads. But anyway, we'll take it as it comes. It says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now that's a big lot of words, isn't it? First of all, don't let the word repentance confuse you. This still has got nothing to do with being a Christian. This is a message to people in the covenants. And you say, in the covenants, what do you mean? This is a message to people who are either in the Mosaic covenant because they're a Jew. Or they're in the covenant with Noah because they're a Gentile. But they're in the covenants. Come in, take a seat. Um, yes, they're in the covenants. And in the covenants, what God does to people in the covenants is he calls upon those in the covenants and he says, I want you to come back to the Lord your God. You've got away from him. I want you to come back to him. Okay? It's not at all to do with becoming a Christian. Now let me explain this. <clears throat> now if I might put it in a, for, a, a, a straightforward way to you. You who despise the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and patience. In other words, what God has done in this world is this is that he's been kind to this world. When the Apostle Paul was on Mars Hill preaching to the people at Athens, he said this. He said, God has been kind to you. He's given you the seasons. He's given you food to eat, filling your heart with gladness. And every time you eat a big, bountiful meal of fruit and vegetable and meat, you should say, thank the God of heaven for this food. Now then, he says, the purpose of that, the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and patience was 
that his goodness should cause you to return to the God of creation and be thankful to him. That's the point. You see, it's supposed to lead people to think again. Now that little word repentance, let me just explain, it's nothing to do with becoming a Christian. That little word repentance, it means simply this. It means to have an afterthought. Have you ever in your life thought, oh, I've just forgotten something and it's just come to my memory now. Now that is repentance. It means to think again. It means to think about afterwards. Now most people, Christians, say, no, 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 Stephen, you don't understand. Repentance means to give up sin. Well, no, it can't mean that. Because if repentance meant to give up sin, then God could not repent, could he? But the Bible says on a number of occasions that God repented. It says he repented in the days of Noah that he'd made mankind. Was it a sin to make mankind? No. Had God committed a sin? Impossible. God cannot commit sin. So it can't mean then to stop sinning. It's a special Greek word. It means to think about the past. It means, now we have a word in our English language which I believe means almost exactly the same thing. And it's the word regret. Regret. Now let me tell you something. Nobody gets saved by regretting. My mother used to say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Let me tell you, the road to hell is paved with people who regretted all their lives. Trouble is they didn't get saved. That's the problem. So, the goodness of God then, in his patience, in his rich, the richness of his goodness, should leave, lead unbelievers to think again. To think again about the wayward life they've lived and the sins they've committed and to return to the Lord their God. And some of you may be saying, to the Lord their God? What do you mean these people aren't saved? Listen now. Whether these people are saved or not is quite irrelevant. The important thing is, he is the Lord God of every human being, whether they're saved or not. He's the Lord God of wicked people, just the same. And they need to return to the Lord their God. Now the next sentence is a typical what I call a Paul sentence begins in verse 5 and if you've got a Bible that has this, the, uh, the full stops in the right place you'll see that it goes on this sentence for 119 words I don't think it's the longest sentence in the Bible but it's a pretty long one so we're going to break it up we're going to break it up into some of his little mini phrases he says but after your hardness and impenitent heart you are treasuring up for yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God let me explain that to you what Paul is saying is because your hearts your hearts are hard and unrepentant you are storing up for yourself more and more wrath for the day when God will reveal his righteous assessment of your life. Now that's a fearful thing, isn't it? Imagine that. Imagine people who are not Christians. They're doing things which God makes which God becomes more and more angry every day. You see, well, I never knew that God was angry. I thought that God was just love, that he just loved everybody. No, no, that's not how it is at all. What we're having here is a complete expose of how God deals with the whole of mankind. And God doesn't love wickedness. Just like a mother hates the disease of the child that's, taking, that's being taken away from her. She sits by the hospital bed. There's nothing evil about a hatred like that. Because that comes from a heart of love. And God himself... He says um, he has wrath um, and one day God will reveal his righteous assessment of the lives of unbelievers. 
I think on that day, you know, nearly everybody that will stand there, if not everybody that will stand there, will have the shock of their lives. Do you know why? Because we have fairly poor memories, don't we? Especially we have fairly poor memories about things that we do wrong because our conscience likes to block it out. We don't like to think about what we've done wrong. But on that day, people are going to have a shock. What they're going to discover is that God writes books. You see, this particular judgment here is referred to in Revelation chapter 20 as the judgment of the great white throne. When you turn to Revelation 20, you'll discover something quite surprising. It says, and the books will be opened. And you think, what? What books? The books will be opened and everyone will be judged according to what's written in the books. And there'll be another book opened, the book of life. Now that's the book of not everyone that's a Christian, it's not quite like that. It's the book of everyone that's alive. And if your name is not found written in that book, then you go to the lake of fire. So I didn't know that. I didn't know God kept a book. I want you to imagine somebody, an angel, follows you around every day. And every foul word, we make a note of that. And every bad attitude, we'll make a note of that. And everything that's written down, it gets, God becomes more and more and more angry. In fact, the Bible says that the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. Are you angry with the wicked? I am. When someone steals from you, are you angry? Or you ought to be. Are you angry when crimes are committed against you? you? Say, well, I want to try and forgive people. I understand. We all want to try and do that. But they produce an adverse reaction, don't they? Now, take a look at verse 6. Take a look at verse 6, because verse 6 should send a cold chill down the spine of everyone that's not a Christian. It says... Who will render to every man according to his deeds? You say, well, I didn't know God was going to do that. Yes, that's what God will do. God will pay back every man according to what he's done. To those that were unmerciful, he will have no mercy. To those that were cruel, he will be cruel. That's quite shocking, isn't it? You see, the, and to those that are unforgiving, he will have no forgiveness. This is what you call the righteous judgment of God. Now let me ask you something. He will render to every man according to his deeds. This verse doesn't just apply, it applies to all people that are not Christians, of course. But it applies to them in two separate groups. Did you know, and this might be a shock to you, that amongst people that are not Christians, there are two separate groups. You could say, oh, it's male and female. Yeah, we understand that. Adults and children. Yeah, we understand that. English and the rest. Yeah, we understand that. English and foreigners. That's what we mean. No, what we're talking about here is the righteous and the wicked. So hang on a minute, Stephen. Are you, are you telling me that there's people that are not Christians that are righteous? Yes, I am. That little lady down the old road who always gives to charity has never heard a flea, never told a lie as far as she knows, all her life. Do you think God calls her wicked? No, she's not a wicked person. She's a righteous person because she does that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. Funnily enough, she may not be a Christian yet. Okay? She may never be a Christian. We'll talk about that in a minute. But then there's that other person down the road. And he's a thoroughly bad lot. He's been in trouble with the police. He's a criminal. He's hurt people. Some of the hurt that he's done in life will never ever be healed. That's how bad it is. That's what God calls the wicked. So God will pay back to every man according to what he's done. Now then, verse 7 might be a little bit of a conundrum for you. 
it says to them who let me read it in the authorised version to them who by patient continuance in doing well or well doing seek for glory, honour and immortality eternal life now the way that sentence is constructed is uh, I'll explain it in the way in which it could be constructed better those who are continuously patient in doing good deeds and who seek for glory and honour and immortality they will receive eternal life you say I didn't know that didn't you did you know that long after the rapture and all the church have all been taken home to heaven God's going to be dealing with the rest of the world <clears throat> and not all the rest of the world will go to hell after that there will be lots of people who do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord will they become Christians? well no because the church is all complete by then well what will God do with them? well at the end of time before the millennial kingdom is established he will raise from the dead all those righteous that have ever lived and they'll stand again upon the earth and they'll enter that kingdom that will last forever now I'll tell you who's going to be there in that company Job remember Job the one who suffered he said this he says I know that in my flesh I shall see God and that I shall stand upon the earth so how can a man that's dead stand upon the earth he can stand upon the earth if God brings him back from the dead of course he can and that's what's going to happen and what sort of person was Job was he a Christian no <laughs> Job was never a Christian he wasn't even a Jew he was a Gentile but what he was was this he was a person who never sinned with his lips his wife said to him why don't you just curse God and then he'll kill you and he said now, don't be silly now don't be silly I've, he's done nothing to hurt me how can I possibly curse him he was what the Bible calls a righteous man he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord what was the great promise that God promised to all those people that are righteous well he didn't promise that they become Christians he didn't promise that they would come into a relationship with him they were already in a relationship with him under the covenants what was promised to these Old Testament saints is this is that when they died they'd be rising again and that when they rise again they'd enter into a kingdom that would last forever take a look at Hebrews chapter 11 and you'll see that none of the people there ever became a Christian in Hebrews chapter 11 why? because one was looking for a city another one was looking for a better country another one was looking for a kingdom none of them were looking to become a Christian and that's the point about the righteous is that they will be rewarded for their patience in doing well that's the fair thing to do isn't it put your hand up if you think that's not fair of course it's fair that's what God does he is the ultimate fair person and because they honestly did what was right God will reward them with eternal life but let me ask you something if you're a Christian and you've got eternal life now you didn't get it as a reward did you no you didn't get it because you were good you got it because Jesus was good your eternal life was a gift not a reward now separate that separates you from the Old Testament saints once and forever they are rewarded for being good you receive it when you when you own up to be a vile hell deserving sinner and he gives you a gift that you don't deserve and that's called grace and forgiveness now verse 8 and 9 you say well if that's okay then that's what's going to happen to the righteous what's going to happen to the rest well in verse 8 he says but to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil to the Jew first and also to the Gentile now that is how this world works so, uh, uh, what do you mean how does this world work 
This is how this world works. Everybody that's not a Christian, this is how it works. If you do what's good and right in the eyes of the Lord, then God will bless you. And even if you die, he'll raise you from the dead and take you into his kingdom. That's for the righteous. But for those that are evil, who are argumentative, who rebel against God, but obey unrighteousness, God will send them four things. Indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. Do you know, I've seen that in the lives of some people. One great famous atheist at the very moment in which he died, he was at the, at the last stage, what you call the anguish. And at the very last moment of his life, he raises his fist and he says, you see, this man hated God. And he was going through immense anguish. Do you see the point now? And God sends indignation, wrath, tribulation and anguish on every human that does evil. And this applies just the same to whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile. You see, the Jews had this idea. Well, we're, we're Jews. God loves us. Nothing that we can ever do will be wrong. In fact, they used to have a bit of a sort of a legend. They used to say that, um, that Abraham has got a little seat at the gate of hell. And any Jew that happens to walk by, he grabs them by the scruff of the neck and says, Not for you, and takes them to heaven. That's just a complete fiction. God treats the Jew and the Gentile exactly the same, fairly. If they're righteous, they're blessed. And if they're evil, they're damned. That's what you call the righteous judgment of God in, it says um, but take a look at verse 10 but glory honour peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile for there is no respect of persons with God what does that mean no respect of persons sounds like a bad thing doesn't it what it means is this is that God doesn't honour a man just because of the label he's got. It might say on your chest, Jew. Sorry, that doesn't cut any ice with him. He isn't, he isn't, he, he does not have prejudice. That's the idea. He does not have him prejudice in favour of a man just because he happens to be a Jew. No, 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 it's not like that at all. He treats all men fairly. Those that are wicked perish those that are righteous go into eternal life now how does this affect how you think about the world it affects how you think about your neighbours they might be the righteous they don't have a long criminal record it's likely they are the righteous but they might not be Christians and suddenly this world takes on a different hue suddenly we walk down the street and you look around it's not, it's not a world full of hell deserving uh, wicked people it's a world full of some that are wicked but some that are righteous trouble is of course we don't necessarily know which are which do we suddenly this world becomes a friendly place now God gives glory honour peace to every man that works good, praise his name. And the same is true for the Jew and Gentile. God is not prejudiced in favour of the Jews. Now that's not a very uh, commonly expressed view today. There's lots of people, oh yes, we're supporting Israel, we're supporting Israel. Listen, we're only supporting Israel when they do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Paul says about the Jews, he says, they're enemies for your sake. Enemies of Christians for your sake. Does that mean that they're all wicked? Not at all. It just means that we mustn't let our eyes become clouded with rose-coloured spectacles towards Jews. They will be dealt with absolutely fairly, just the same as the rest. And you know, people say, oh well, the poor Jews, they suffered the Holocaust. Listen, Gentiles have had Holocausts too. And not all Jews are good. And not all Gentiles are bad. See the point? 
We need to just reassess our thinking on things like this. But this is about how God deals with men and women outside of grace. And we all understand grace and salvation, don't we? But most of us don't understand the world in which we live. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, what about those people that aren't saved? What will God do for them? Well, God will judge the unsaved. And if they've done good, he will bless them. And if they've done wicked, he will curse them. Now, I want you to take a look at verse 6. Sorry, not verse 6. I'm just going to summarize what it says in those couple of verses. It says, He will render to every man according to his deeds. Those who in continuous patience in doing well and who seek for glory and honour and immortality, which is eternal life, the righteous will be rewarded for their patience in doing well, but the argumentative and the rebellious against God, who obey unrighteousness, God will send them indignation, wrath, tribulation and anguish on every human being that does evil. And this applies as much to the Jew as it does to the Gentile, but God gives glory, honour and and peace on every man that does good. I hope that none of you are trusting in God for this. You know, Judas was a righteous man for many years of his life. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus. And he was a righteous man. He was a preacher of the gospel of the kingdom. No doubt he healed people. You couldn't have distinguished Judas from anybody else until the day when he betrayed the Lord. You see, under the old covenants, you could lose it all. Under grace, you can't lose it at all. See the difference? Now take a look at verse 12. We're nearly finished. For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So the Gentiles will be judged outside of the old covenant. They have a law, of course. The law of Noah and the law of conscience. The Jews will not be judged outside of the Old Covenant. They will be judged by the Old Covenant. That's what he's saying. So verse 13. He says it's not the hearers of the law that are judged, that are just before God. It's the doers of the law that are justified. There were lots of people in Israel, you see. They went to synagogue every Sunday, sorry, every Sabbath. And they listened to the law being read. And then they went out and did as wicked as they possibly could. Every day of the week. Paul says it isn't those who hear it. It's those who do it. That are righteous. Verse 14. For when the Gentiles which do not have the law. Do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law of Moses. Are a law unto themselves. You've heard that expression. A law unto themselves. What that means is this. The Gentiles who are not under the Mosaic law, who naturally keep the spirit of the law, are a law to themselves. The law is, as it were, written on their hearts, and their conscience is their guide. It either excuses them or it accuses them. And their conscience, for some people, the conscience of a, right, conscience of a righteous man is a good thing. Conscience of a wicked man is no help at all. Verse 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So, so this isn't the gospel of God's grace. This is Paul explaining how it works in the world outside of Christianity. Let me say something. If you're, if you're unsaved, then this is what's going to happen to you. He will judge the secrets of men. He says, this is my gospel. And the judge of men, who is who's the judge of men? The Lord Jesus is the judge of men. The Lord Jesus who came and died upon a cross is the one that's been designated to be the judge of all men. Nobody will stand before him and say, oh, you don't understand. You say, well, I'm afraid I do. And nobody will stand there and say, but I'm unemployed. You say, yeah, no, so have I been unemployed. 
And nobody will stand there and say, but I'm bereaved. He'll say, yes, and so was I at the tomb of Lazarus. You see, there's nothing that a man can bring before the judge on that day. Nobody on that day can say, but I was tired. He'll say, yes, I know when I was asleep in the boat. And they'll say, yeah, but I was hungry. That's why I stole. And the Lord, and the Lord Jesus will say, yes, and I had 40 days of fasting. See the point? There's no excuse before the judge on that day. So Paul explains, it's not those who know about God's righteousness that will go into everlasting bliss. It's not those who talk about it. It's those who do it. And the Lord will hold all men responsible for what they do in the light of what they know. See, when you go to court, what they're trying to do at court is this. They're trying to find out whether you, what is your level of responsibility. For example, somebody goes to court and he's convicted of murder and he stands there and all the evidence is put there and it's all the, the, the jury decide that he's guilty and then we discover that he has a mental age of two. Are we going to execute him? No. It's not right. That's not right, is it? And so what, what, what the, a, a human court of law does is it tries to figure out what's going on in the heart of a man by what he's done. Now God doesn't do it like that. God does it the other way around. God already knows what you're like in your heart and he judges you for what you've done in the light of who you are. Now that's what you call the righteous judgment of God. So he will hold men responsible for what they do in the light of what they know. How terrible will be that day. God is not impressed by titles, by power, by money and by status. God looks at every man with utter lack of prejudice. The word prejudice and God can't be used in the same sentence. God doesn't prejudge anyone. His judgment is just and straight and truth. And when the Lord Jesus establishes the great white throne, all the secrets of men will be revealed. Some of you may be saying, I didn't know about this great white throne. Well, if you go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15, you'll find the whole thing is exposed there. Wow. Wow. What a passage. I knew that this passage today was going to be important. I knew that it was going to be a revelation to many of us. To imagine what the world is like outside of Christianity. To know that there are people outside of Christianity that are good people. And there's people outside of Christianity that are bad people. How will God deal with them? Well, he will reward the righteous. And he will condemn the wicked. May God bless each one of you today. Let's let's um, 